Greetings, y'all. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life, an interview show where poets get to talk about uh, the things that we know and love the most, which is our process and our lives. My name is Chris August, and I am so thrilled and honored to be sitting next to the inimitable Taylor Molly, in addition to being the author of four collections of poetry, having more slam poetry titles than I even know how to count. Uh, this man also is really, if I had to pick one thing, figure whose work really showed me how to become a writer, and especially one who writes from the lens of an educator. It is this man. So welcome, Mr. Taylor Molly. Mr. Chris August, I can't imagine being in better company. Uh, that is, I will take that. I'm just going to take that and run. So uh, we were discussing earlier the fact that because I came into the slam poetry scene uh, well into your reign as an elder, uh, you know, in my mind, you sort of dropped out of the sky doing this. So if, if you could just talk a little bit about what your early introductions to writing and to poetry were, how you found uh, the performance end of poetry, I would, I would love to know all of that. For me, poetry was always a performative art because I grew up watching my father recite rhyming toasts at birthdays and weddings and significant anniversaries. And he would clink a glass and then recite a toast to the bride and groom and everybody loved them. And they, they, they rhymed and it was sort of Dr. Seuss meets Robert Frost. Sentimental, yes, funny, but heartfelt and well rehearsed, never memorized, but he knew that when speaking in public without a microphone, just speak louder than you think possibly you need to and it will be almost loud enough. So it was very much of a, of a public art form. I wrote poetry in middle school. I wrote poetry, I was the editor of the high school literary magazine called Proof Rock. Yeah. And then I was, wrote poetry in college. And I went, to, but I was an actor. And I went to drama school after college to study with members of the Royal Shakespeare Company in Oxford, a program that they had to get poets, get actors, American actors, to work with British actors so that they could do Shakespeare better. And it was while at Oxford that at the end of the program, we had a talent show, and I decided that I was going to write a poem, uh, very much like my father's, a, a poem written in rhyming couplets about the experience of spending a summer in Oxford, English, England, studying with members of the Royal Shakespeare Company, except that it was 1987, so I did it as a rap. Obviously. With my, you know, beatboxing here and there. And the audience just loved it, and I thought, I write poetry, and I have skills as an actor. Why don't I combine those two? I go to graduate school, and it's in Kansas in 1992, two years into a graduate program where nobody quite knew what to do with me. I was always a little too literary for the actors and a little too histrionic for the poets. One of my master's professors says, have you heard about this thing they do in Lawrence? on the fourth Monday of every month. It's called a slam. I think you'd be good at it. So this is 1992. I drive to this slam that they have in Lawrence, Kansas, and I realized this is the perfect place for me to marry my skills as a writer and my skills as an actor. Like, this is the art form for me. Unbeknownst to me, the very first national championships had been in the Bay Area in 1990. Right. It took me another year to get my degree from C Kansas State University. I go to Maine, I start a slam, and I go, and in 1994, I compete in my first slam. We make it to the finals, I make it to the finals again in 95, and then I win for the first year in 96, win again in 97, piss a whole punch, bunch of people off. Uh, process, right? Take the next year off, come back in 1999, do terribly, come back in 2000, win again for the third time, take a year off, come back in 2002, win again for the fourth time, and I don't know where you 
where you entered in Immediately all of this? Immediately after that, after after your fourth win. I came okay, in in so, 03. Yeah. It was my first Nationals. But I had seen the footage of the 02 Nationals. So, uh, you know, so, so I, that, and that was my first glimpse, one of this Taylor Molly fellow. It was, it was certainly real early on to even understanding what slam was and seeing you representing yourself as a teacher the way that you did. And I had just become a special ed teacher uh, that year. So that was really, you know, a, a magical thing. And what's, uh, what's really pointed about it is that, you know, that, that sort of synthesis that you were talking about of being a little too theatrical for the poets and, and a little too, too poety for, you know, for the, uh, the actors is, I feel like that is, I always, I always talk to, to folks about like, you know, you, you find your, your unicorns, right? You find your, your fellow folks who are weird in the ways that you are. And, and I think that the people who really take to slam are the ones who aren't just actors and aren't just looking for somewhere to give their poems, but but come to it with with it as a holistic experience, right? And I think that that upbringing that that you have of the you know of of things were always being sort of recited and performed and written. I think that's really that's kind of the perfect uh, that's 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 the process, right? Well, I always used to say that. I like to tell people that in the Molly family, no one was allowed to leave the dinner table unless it was to look up a word in the dictionary. It's not actually true, but I like telling this people This is good that. enough, right, yeah. And, and I mean, it certainly creates that kind of mythology of, uh, I feel like it's, it's, it's such an ideal kind of upbringing, right, is, is to be brought up with, uh, already with the love of language instilled in you. Uh, that's. That's, I mean, that's really cool. Like, what a, you know, what a great head start you had, and how fabulously you used it, you know. So, so by the time that that I was aware of you, which is like 02, 03, um, we were talking about this notion of becoming an elder. You, you had that role hard. So, what was what was the process of becoming this this notable figure in in this scene? Well, we haven't even. Maybe we're at the day and age where nobody has to explain what a slam is anymore, but it's competitive poetry reading judged by five randomly selected members of the audience. And I took it really seriously from, from the get-go. <laughs> I was a very competitive person, and anybody who came to the slam without wanting to win, why are they there? You know? So I, I feel like I just discovered a bunch of strategies that were very effective mm -hmm. about 11 months before other people did. Uh, just uh, maybe three or four examples of, of not, I don't want to say loopholes, but sometimes it's a gray area. Uh, in the beginning, there was no rule book. Every year, who, whichever host city was going to be putting on the nationals would sort of recreate the rules as best they right. could. And sometimes they would get it wrong, which left an opportunity. Like one year, in 1996, the, the first year that my team from Providence won, there was a rule saying group pieces are encouraged so long as the poem being performed was written by one of the people on stage. That's not what they meant to say. Right. But that's not what they said either. Exactly. So, so uh, we did a poem that I had written. I got to do my own poem, mm -hmm. and then when it was came time for the weakest guy on our team, who was not really the weakest guy on our team, but he had given up his spot, we, we said, okay, in your spot, we're gonna do the group piece. And everybody freaked out, like, you can't do that. And my response was, why? Oh, sh where? 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 Right? where? Show me where it says you can't do that. Well, and even beyond just those gray area kind of things, something that I have found, because another way in which you definitely kind of uh, charted a path for me was I'm also a strategist for days. One of the things that I love about SLAM is that it isn't uh, static in the way that, that even a great poetry reading could be. Uh, the audience is engaged in so many ways, and one of them is is that they get to decide a big part of the outcome of things. Um, a thing that I definitely have found is that if people know that you come to a slam with a strategy in mind and thinking about ways of winning, that immediately can label you by some folks as soulless, as missing the point of, of sharing poetry. What, you know, what was it like for you to be sort of labeled as this strategy first, art later kind of, kind of person that, you know, that I know you not to be? Well, in Slam Nation, Paul Devlin, the director, gave a camera 
to the New York team. He gave it to a guy named Mums the Schemer, mm -hmm. and Saul Williams was on the New York team, and if I had to put money on what team was going to win, it would have been the New Yorican team with Saul Williams on it. So you, we really Saul got Williams in and that. Bosia and Jessica Kerr Moore and Mums and Mums who goes on to be in Oz, right? You right, know, like. right. And so we get this backstage footage of 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 them, uh, of them performing and 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 and, and rehearsing and inadvertently breaking the rule that everybody accused me of breaking because you can see them in their hotel room. Uh, blatantly rehearsing a group piece that Saul that wrote. That is Saul's, right, yeah. Right. While Saul was also going to right, do of course, his solo of course. piece. But, right. but, the reason, but, but nobody's complaining about that because... Mm -hmm. Because that's I, not who he is, right? Right, uh, right. But... Uh, and that's a the thing, by the way, that I still have to point out to people who watch Slam Nation. Slam Nation, by the way, is a, is a documentary from uh, 1996 that follows the National Poetry Slam. Uh, and when, when people watch it, everybody hops on the... Taylor Molly's gonna pull something bandwagon. And I have had to point out to people, I'm like, actually, the team who did break the rule was a different team and was and was the guy you were rooting for. And I don't think they really thought about the fact that they were doing it, but either way, they did. Well, yeah, they my favorite my favorite comment about that movie, and we should probably stop talking about the movie after this, was a reviewer who said, the casual observer of Paul Devlin's Slam Nation. Um, we'll notice that Taylor Molly wants you to think that all he cares about is winning. And Saul Williams wants you to think that all he cares about is poetry. The astute observer can tell that they are both lying. <laughs> Saul cares about winning. Sure. And I care about poetry. But to me, the Latin poet Horace over 2,000 years ago said that the task of the poet was to either instruct or delight, and that we can we should reserve our greatest respect for those who can do both at the same time. So when I, when I write, I try to do both. I try to delight and I try to instruct. If I can't do both, and you're probably the same way, if I can't do both of those, let me be merely delightful than just solely instructive. But the truth is that people are going to listen to the beauty of your words more, your words will find a deeper place and stay there if they, if people can enjoy them on their way down, you know? So, so I take the competition very seriously, but, but, the, but the way to compete is to have good and memorable poetry. That's it. And speaking of good and memorable poetry, Taylor Molly, I would love if you read us a poem and since we have uh, your newest collection, Bouquet of Red Flags, right on the ready, uh, there is a, a piece that you were describing as one of your Ars Poetica uh, pieces called My Deepest Condiments that uh, I, would, I would love to hear and then chat about. I actually have this memorized. Sh should I pretend I'm reading it out of the book, or you, should you I? You can do it however you want. I mean, we plugged you. you if you want to flash it to the camera real quick, it's like however you want to do it. I send you my deepest condiments was in no way what my old friend meant to say or write or send the night she penned a note to me one week after my father died. Not condolences or sentiments. No, she sent me her deepest condiments instead as though the dead have need of ketchup, mustard, or relish on the other side. And oh, that word made me laugh so hard out loud it hurt, so beautifully absurd. And such a sweet relief during a time when it seemed that only grief was allowed in after my father's death. Sweet and simple laughter, which is nothing more than breath, brought up from so far deep inside so many years, it often brings up with it tears. And so I laughed and I laughed until my sides were sore. And later, I think I may have even cried a little more. Thank you. So I feel like uh, that, which is beautiful and thank you, uh, leads to, to a little bit of discussion of process because you are someone whose work I think wears a whole lot of different uh, masks. It has a lot of different faces just in, in that piece alone as is the case I think with, with the great uh, Taylor Molly pieces. Uh, there's just this array of emotions and experience. So how do you, how do you even go about 
planning for, for work like that, that works on so many levels? That's practically a found poem. Of course, it didn't, in real life, it didn't happen to me. Yes, my father died. I never got a condolence letter like that. I heard the story from someone else. The wife comes home and says, did you, did you write a letter to Dave about, his, about the death of his dad? And the husband goes, yeah, I sent him an email. It's in the sent folder. And she goes and says, oh, honey, you said condiments instead of condolences. And he said, can, can, you, can you retract the email? And she goes, no, you haven't been able to do that since 1998. And they go to the funeral. And they went up and he said, hey, listen, I want to apologize because I don't know whether you noticed. And the guy whose father died just said, thank you. Thank you. That was the best condolence letter, excuse me, condiment letter that I received because I got to laugh. So I tend to write a lot of poems about reaching for the, reaching for the right word, accidentally grasping the wrong word, but how ultimately the wrong word sometimes ends up being the perfect word. I, I like to, I'm working on a philosophy of poetry where you gotta throw yourself under the bus constantly. And I like to tell my students when I'm, when I'm, when I'm hired at a, at a college to teach a, a writing workshop, they didn't bring me in to teach a writing workshop, but they, but they did bring you in, and you and I do this. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. And I say, a poem is a terrible place to brag to the world how awesome you are. I already know you're awesome. That's why I don't care. Nobody cares, because everybody's awesome. But how are you broken? Because everybody is also miraculously broken. Tell us how you've survived being broken. So that's, as I get older and more things happen to me, I, I find that I'm, I'm constantly trying to throw myself under the bus, which is particularly important for white male poets there to do is. as well. Yeah, yeah. No, and so speaking of that, uh, talk about, cause you know, when, when you began, and, and one of the important things I think for people to understand in terms of when we're talking about slam poetry and performance poetry, is that in any environment where you yourself are being evaluated on, on top of your work, right? Where we can see you, the poet, and then as soon as we get off stage, we're gonna go interact with the poets. I think the stakes socially become much higher, and I think people are much more examined than, than might be the case in other situations. So what, as a, as, as a white male in, in a scene that does a whole lot of dissecting of, of privilege, of, of social relationships, uh, hierarchies, and all that type of thing. What, what has that process been for you over the years of how, how you identify, how you represent yourself, uh, for uh, who else you feel as though you are you know, representing? What's, what's, what's the arc of that like? Well, for a long time, I didn't even really address my own privilege because uh, I, in a way, I'm the last person to be able to address it. And also, I just never found it that interesting. And uh, my poetry, except when I'm talking about education and teaching, uh, it's, not a, it's not very political. Um, there needs to be uh, poetry out there for, I, I, you know, a lot of people who go to SLAM say, yeah, you know what, I just, I felt like I was being yelled at the entire time, and, and I'm very sensitive to that, and so I, my dad never addressed his own privilege. Right. He only applied to one college, Yale, and it's because that's where his father went, and his brothers, it was, through, things were so different. My grandfather on the other side said, prejudiced? How can you call me prejudiced? I don't even know any people of color. He yep. probably didn't say people of color, but it, the, it, it, things were so insular. And I grew up a very sheltered, insular life on Park Avenue of all places. Right. And yeah. so I didn't, I didn't address it. For a, for a long time. Uh, so so what was it like when you know suddenly you're in this artistic community where these conversations are happening? And so what's you know what? Well, I think that people resented me for doing well in the slam without addressing my uh, my privilege or 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 my complicit part in the act of oppression. I just had 
poems that were delightful and, and instructive. and Which in and of itself, we forget, is totally privileged, is, right? That idea I, that we can write about what we want to write about, right? right. That there's this whole range, you know, these, there, there's not this backlog of stuff that, you know, that, that we have to get out or, you know? That's, uh, there's a young poet in my scene named Nina, and she said, I, I like your work because it seems like you can write about anything. And I have to write about, uh, you know, issues of body image, and I have to write about mental health. And you know, you wanna say, no you don't. You can write about anything, but also there's a, it's the, it's the ninth grade essay syndrome, which is when you as a teacher say, okay, class, freshman, the essays due next week have to be on this topic. They go, why can't we write about our own topic? And then when you say, okay, for the next essay, you can write about whatever you want. Oh, I don't know what's about. I don't know what to write about. Why don't you just give us something to write about? You know, you, anybody can write about anything. Uh, if. If if you could do the uh, the your your Mobius uh, bit, I would I would love for that to be how uh, how don't... this little movement of, uh, of of the interview culminates. Are you doing the thirty thirty challenge? It's it's April two thousand and fifteen right now. I don't know when anybody's going to watch this, but. I, you, I know you've done it in I the have, past. Yeah, I, I have attempted. Uh, April the, is Poetry uh, the, Month, the 30, 30, and so many of get to our... about 21, 30. Yeah. <laughs> well, this year, for reasons you know of, I've been a little bit busier than, than normal, so I haven't done a poem a day. But that's what we do. For, for, the, for the month of April, we try to write a poem a day and post it to social media. So this was the poem from yesterday, and it just it, it ended up being about white privilege, and I wrote it on a Mobius strip, you know, which is a... a strip of paper where you just twist it at the end so it just has it has no end and no beginning and and the poem goes and I actually posted it as a video so I'm gonna pretend that I'm reading off of a Mobius strip and it goes I've been given a lot in my life for no reason except I am a white man but also because I asked for it then again I may have only thought to ask because I am a white man, and I have been given a lot in life only because I am a white man. It's, the poem is really about compound interest, and sure, so you asked, if you grow up like I did, having s almost everything you need given to you just because you are a certain type of person, you grow up thinking, the world wants to give me what I want, right. and I just need to ask politely. So I ask politely for things, and I get them. And to a lot of the world, everything I get, I get only because of who I am. And they ignore the fact that I ask for a lot of things, but you don't think to ask them unless you have a, this compound interest history of getting what you want. Right, yeah, that's it, that's it, and that's, and- I'm glad and, you like that poem. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, and I feel like there, there need to be, there needs to be more of that. Uh, you know, I was, I was telling someone, you, you took on a really amazing mission of trying to, uh, to encourage 1,000 uh, people to become teachers. I, I am in the throes of starting to try and get 1,000 white people to write their first race poem, so I love that that, that is a thing, you know, that, that you were doing, so. Um, you, know, you know the guy who got shot in the back eight times by the cop? Uh, Recently. The, mm -hmm, yeah, and you, people were saying, uh, you know, why did he run? He'd still be alive today if he didn't run. Well, of course, he'd still be alive today if the cop didn't shoot him sure. eight times in the back, but you, he ran because he doesn't have a history of good interactions with the police. Right. You, you, you need to have had a lot of good and respectful interactions with the police in order yeah. to realize don't run. It doesn't exist in it's a vacuum, just, you right? You cannot, it, yeah, exactly. So uh, I don't know that we'll have enough time for you to uh, to read the, the poem that I requested that uh, that was going to sort of inspire this, but I feel like there is no better way to segue into uh, the, the most recent exciting event in your life than this. Uh, I'm a daddy. I, right? Yeah, I'm you a daddy. became a dad. So so um, can you talk about how how that has informed everything in your life, especially uh, how you write, how you interpret your own work uh, pre-baby, you know, all of this. Give me. Well, give me the I find myself deadness. reading poems 
I wrote a, a poem about the tragedy at Sandy Hook, and it's a chazal, and the, the where, Persian form where you repeat part of the last line in every line, and it's about, uh, there's a, there was a teacher named Vicky Soto who, she was the one who hid all of her students in like cupboards and you're in, you hide in the bathroom and you hide in the closet. So when Adam Lanza bursts in the room, uh, he says, where are your students? And she said, they're at lunch. So he killed her, Victoria Soto, and all of those students lived. And so uh, I had a reading. My son was born January 2nd of 2015. I have a reading up in Canada in March, I think, early March. And I'm reading this poem for the first time as a father. And I start to cry in front of 2,000 people. And uh, it just brought m you know, more levels of, uh, I, I didn't really understand what it was like to lose a child, you know? Now I have one. Um, I'm tired all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the road now, so. Uh, I would get to write in my hotel room tonight, except I've got a flight at 6.40 tomorrow to go up to Hartford. And, but I find myself singing little songs to my son. Not that those are gonna become poems, but like I'll say to my son, oh, it sounds like, smells like you had an accident. You know, I think I need to change you. And then I realize, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change. So I start singing my, to my son, I'm gonna change you. I think I'll change you into a bird, you know? And now I'm gonna change you into a little frog. And this well could become your son's equivalent of those little toasts that, you know, that your dad right. did back in the day, right? It's a right. beautiful, beautiful cycle. Yeah. I have to say to you before we uh, wind things down, I've, you know, we've known each other for, you know, a decade plus, and, you know, we've had lots of conversations. I have never seen you smile the way that you did when I asked you when you first came in about your child, about your son, and, and I feel like your work, all of that, is, is beaming in that same kind of way. Uh, Y'all, I'm Chris August. I have had the pleasure of, uh, of giving to you Taylor Molly. Uh, thank you so much for joining us with Hoko Pulitzo's The Writing Life. Uh, Thank you guys for, uh, for engaging in, in, in what we love so much. Taylor, thank you for being here. Chris, th thank you. Always You're wonderful. A pleasure. You, you got the Jesus thing going. Thank you all so much. Thank you.